Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Gary Matsuoka. We're at Laguna Hills Nursery in Santa Ana, and today's topic is uh, the cool season vegetables. Now, in the last crop rotation, um, fertilizer container growing. So today we're going to focus primarily on the different varieties of vegetables that we grow this time of year and, and some of the quirks that they have. So um, the main thing about crop rotation is to know what family the vegetable is in. So crop rotation is important because every crop leaves behind dead roots of itself which lead to diseases for that particular plant so the next crop you want to put in you don't want it to be related closely to the plant you just pulled out so what you should do if you have beds in your garden or containers is to plant one family of plants in there at a time uh, all at the same time like say tomatoes related to potatoes related to peppers and eggplant and tomatillos so you should plant them all in one bed one year and then switch to a totally different bed the next year. So if you mix up your plants too much and you have tomatoes in every single bed you do, which I have some customers that that's all they want to grow is tomatoes, then the next year they're not going to do as well. And the third year they're going to do really badly because there's too much residue from the previous crops. So uh, most rotations we go and, you know, every three years or every four years. Most farms are at least every four years is what I'm reading in the literature. So uh, we were next to a farm that uh, we leased land from a farm for four years and never saw them put the same crop in the same plot of ground twice in that time we were there. So crop rotation is important. Um, now, a lot of these plants we grow in the cool weather because they don't grow in the, in the hot weather. And there's a couple reasons for that. So one of the real common things that people plant this time here that is real sensitive to heat is coriander or cilantro. So cilantro grows during the cool weather. It grows foliage during the cool weather. And once the temperatures in the daytime top 85, then it sends up the flowers, makes seeds, and it dies. And you can no longer harvest the leaves. So, you know, we had trouble growing this 10 years ago, 2013, or was it 2014, 15, 16, 17? We didn't have any winters. We, we kept hitting 90 degrees in December and January, and the cilantro just kept going to, going to seed. And people would have to plant it over and over and over now. Last year, starting this time of year, there was no heat until summer. So, and that's what I was used to back in the 80s when I first started gardening is that we'd plant cilantro October, November, and it would go until next summer. And it would, then it would seed and then it would die. Um, I think we're going back in that pattern now. This winter or this year, we haven't had any fact we haven't had any serious heat waves this year at all I don't think we hit 100 degrees this year so um, now we're you know we're still going to cycles where it's 70 some weeks for a high and then 80 today is supposed to hit 80 I don't know how <laughs> it's supposed to hit 80 uh, when I got this morning look the thermometer was 43 it's like okay we're gonna have to really climb that ladder to get there so now, the interesting thing about cilantro, people ask me, well, if it takes 85, can I just grow it inside my house? Because my house is never uh, 85 in the, in the summertime. Well, in the studies they did, either if it was 70 degrees constant temperature, it would go to seed. 70 degrees the entire day, it would go to seed. So you have to keep your house in the 60s to grow this inside. Outdoors... The cycling is fine. You can go up to over 80 for cilantro, but you can't go past 85 as long as the nights were cool again in the 50s and 60s. So uh, I'm not sure if you know if plants go by the average temperature or you know what they're doing. But uh, apparently cilantro 
if it's above 70 on average temperature during the day, it still goes to seed. So that's cilantro. Now, lettuce, broccoli, cauliflower all have the same response to warm temperatures. They go to flower. So the, they said the most sensitive crop we grow is, is cauliflower. So here's some cauliflower. And if you break 75 while they're growing, then they go to flower. And again, 10 years ago, we couldn't grow anything, any cauliflower that would make a head bigger than this because every few weeks it would hit 80 and they would start blooming when they're still young and make a head about this big. So you have to have a, a, at least four to six, I would say six weeks of temperatures that just don't break 75 or 80 degrees and that's going to happen late November hopefully through all of December which is the most normal time for us to stay that cool January you never know but um, I think this year uh, earlier this year there was no heat in January either so cauliflower should be easier to grow this year but yeah for five years in a row we couldn't get anything bigger than that and we, and we didn't know why. I mean, I had, to, I had to do a lot of research and find out that, uh, yeah, if once it hits 75, they initiate their flowering. Broccoli is not quite as bad. See, cauliflower, the problem with cauliflower, it only makes one crop of flowers. So you're stuck with just one little head and that's it. The plant's done. Whereas broccoli, it can bloom over and over and over. Same plant. So if you get that heat wave first, you'll get smaller heads, but it'll keep making them. So at least you get something. But if you get, you know, a couple of months of nice cool weather, you'll get a plant, you know, the foliage be a clump about two by two almost. And then it makes a really nice big head. So, and we should be able to do that this year with, with the broccoli. Now, some plants in that family the broccoli cauliflower is the brassica family, also known as the uh, cruciferas. Um, kale is part of that family, but kale doesn't respond to heat. So kale you can grow any time of the year because it, it doesn't seem to bloom when it's hot. Uh, now it may belong to the, some of the families that are biennial. So the uh, parsley and celery and carrots are definitely biennials, which means they grow through one winter and then they bloom. So with parsley, we know we tell people well, if you get parsley growing before winter starts, next spring they're going to bloom and go to seed and die. But if you start parsley once winter starts and it's growing as the weather, well, it may be day length, not actually the temperature, but as, as the days get longer, it doesn't, it doesn't um, bloom. It has to go through one whole winter cycle, longer days to shorter days, back to longer days, and then, and it, so this plant's gonna bloom next spring and that's the end of its life. But if you get one started a month from now, it won't bloom the entire year. It'll just make leaves the entire year. And then after next winter, then it blooms and then it dies. And the same goes apparently for celery and for carrots. Um, yeah, some of the literature, we're not sure if the people who wrote it know what they're talking about because we heard that bok choy, if it's exposed to cold temperatures below 50, then it flowers. That doesn't make sense because it's a cool season vegetable and they tell you it can stand frost. So I think with bok choy, it's another biennial where it goes through a winter and then it's going to bloom. Uh, if you plant it in the spring and it's still cold, that doesn't make it bloom. It has to, has to go through the shortest days of the year to, to trigger that. But I'm not positive. I, I have not grown bok choy myself. Not too certain about that one. Now with lettuce, lettuce is definitely sensitive to temperature, but I haven't read how hot it has to be. I believe most literature will say it's around 75, 
So if it stays below 75 in the daytime, the lettuce does fine. Now, we started growing lettuce at our house in September because the nice thing about getting lettuce, especially if you buy it already grown like this, it only takes two weeks of cool weather to make, reach a, a harvestable size. Now, if it stays cool all winter, then this plant can stay productive until next, next summer. But uh, if you get a heat wave, then, you know, it starts to bolt, starts to grow that stem in the middle. The leaves start getting less tasty or more bitter. Uh, and you've got to start a new crop. But again, it only, you know, once lettuce is this size, it's only like two weeks to get to, to maturity. <clears throat> Well, a lot of these plants can take a light frost, which probably means uh, 25 or so. Um, yeah, most of these plants are coming from Europe, so they're used to, you know, they're used to cold temperatures. Yes. No. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's a hormonal change in the plant that causes that, but uh, yeah. So peas, um, peas can get pretty hot before they finally poop out because uh, they're already blooming anyway. They bloom during the cool season and uh, I believe the literature is saying around 85, they kind of give up. So peas should be good from now all the way into uh, late next spring. Yeah. Spinach is another popular one. Spinach uh, also sends it to warm weather. So this usually bolts if we hit 80 degrees. And spinach seems to need more sun. So a lot of the leaf crops, you can grow them in bright shade, lettuce, Okay, all that bright shade is is okay. I mean, most plants get more energy in the sunlight. Uh, spinach, and you put them in bright shade, they seem to be really slow to get size. I think they need a little more light than some of the other ones. Now, spinach is interesting. It's related to beets. I didn't bring any beets in here. Uh, so it's related to Swiss chard. It's in a... It's in a real small family of plants, Chenopodiaceae, beet Swiss chard, and, I, and spinach belongs in that same group. What's interesting is lettuce um, is related to uh, daisies. So Now the only... Um, tomato family plant that we grow in the winter is potatoes. Potatoes, you can get seed for it. But normally what we do is we get the, the small potatoes, which are called seed potatoes, but they're not really seeds, they're just small potatoes. And we get those usually in, well, I've got a new bulb coming this year, so we're not sure exactly when they're going to send the... I swore I brought my potato seeds up here, but I guess I didn't. I have some potato seeds on the shelf, so you can grow them by seed. I'm not sure exactly when to start it, but the uh, tubers, you start in the winter, but they have to be pre-chilled. So they're coming from a cold climate, you know, high in the mountains of the Andes, of course, uh, Potato country in the United States is Idaho and all the northern states. Um, so potatoes need that cold period, 45 degrees or around 45 degrees for several months before they start growing. So if you buy, get a potato at the supermarket, they might grow because they've been in cold storage. Um, but you have to be careful. We One year we got uh, potatoes from a place in Texas that weren't pre-chilled and thereby planted them and very little results. I mean, nothing hardly grew because we didn't get cold enough that winter to make them grow. So it's better to uh, get the potatoes already chilled by the 
company that sends them to us, and we get them usually February. Uh, I don't know, one year they got them in March, which is pretty late, but it only takes them a couple months to grow and make the potatoes. So, yes. Don't know, don't know. I mean, this the potato companies that sell the seed potatoes just say they may not be virus free. So they, you know, the seed potato companies we buy the little potatoes from, they guarantee that they're virus free. But uh, from coming from the store, they may not be. But I, I wouldn't think, you know, they'd have too many diseases. Enough. You grow potatoes. The key to potatoes is cold dirt. Um, so if you grow them in containers, you have to be careful on some years because if the, the containers usually the, the soil in the containers is usually the same temperature as the air. And if it's too warm that year, uh, the ground usually stays cooler than the air. So, uh, but if you grow them in a pot, some years, if it's too warm in the spring, then they said the tomato, the potato blooms and makes little fruits and seeds instead of making tubers underground. So the key to getting good potatoes is to keep that soil cool. Now, if you use uh, fabric bags, they make these fabric bags potatoes. Those usually stay cooler than the air. Still probably not as good as the ground, but that's better. Or a uh, clay pot would stay better than a, say, a plastic pot. Or if you do have a plastic pot, shade the thing so it doesn't heat up so bad. Uh, and potatoes are a little more unique in that they they make the the potatoes right off the stems. So if you grow potatoes, usually you have them in a ditch with dirt piled on the sides. And as the sprouts come up and they reach about six or eight inches, then you start burying the stems and then they grow the potatoes on those stems. Right. Well, uh, so the potato is the storage organ for a plant going through winter. So I'm sure that the um, it just is triggered to grow after winter is over, rather than before. Whereas seeds usually seeds grow when the weather warms up. So. Uh, so if you're gonna grow from seed, you can grow whenever. You, grow. you can probably start it now. I don't think that there's any problem with that. But the potatoes themselves, yeah, they're waiting for winter to pass. So unless they get their winter, they won't sprout. How much of a time if you want to things to chill and put them in the refrigerator for a period? Well, most things when we chill them, most seeds and plants when we chill them, we chill them for, well, the seeds we chill for three months when we chill seeds. Uh, most plants, I know strawberries, they normally say two weeks. Two weeks in the fridge gives you, well, let's say if, if you're doing chill hours, two weeks at, so 24 times 14, about 300 hours of chill. Now, last year, the potatoes would have grown if you just left them in the ground, because we ended up with over 400 hours of temperatures below 45 degrees this last year. It was... It's the coldest winter in uh, 15 years, so. The chill time doesn't necessarily need to be consecutive. It could be cool and then a little warmer, but then cool again. <laughs> well, there's different ways to measure it. So in the, among fruit trees, there's uh, two methods they use. One is to chill only below, all the time between 45 and 34 degrees. Mm -hmm. And the other one is, they say, well, you, the plants still get chill up until 55, but you lose chill above 50, above 60. Whereas the one where they go measure 45, they don't, they don't care if it gets hot that day. They just measure anything below 45. So it's, it's complicated. I don't think anyone knows exactly how plants measure it yet. Um, so, yes. Have 
No, okay, the question was, are all the vegetables we buy GMO? Um, not really. The main things that have been created in the lab, so they call them GMO, genetically modified, um, are the main crops that the farms use. So, you know, corn, wheat, soybeans, cotton, um, it's got to be something that's grown on mass scale. Um, and, you know, something that's... But those are the main ones. Corn, wheat, soybeans, <coughs> cotton. I can't think of too much else that's been genetically modified. They did, they did tomatoes once back in the 80s with GMO tomatoes, uh, and it was a total failure. It didn't taste any good, it didn't, because what they did is they were choose, they, they created a tomato that would not rot on the shelf. Took out some genes that caused rotting, and uh, but the tomato wasn't very good, so they just gave up on that one. Um, there's probably some GMO potatoes out there, I would think. But generally, you know, when they create those things, the only way they would sell them to you is if you made a, a you know, signed a contract with them. You know, Monsanto holds the rights to most of the GMO things, and, and they wouldn't sell you anything unless you signed a contract. So... No, I mean, okay, so with most fruits, I haven't heard of any that were genetically modified. Well, okay, some citrus have been genetically modified. No, not really. Okay. Now, they have created a line of genetically modified citrus just in case they can't stop this disease that's going around the world. Uh, but the ones they do that they've done, so what they've done on some citrus to make them seedless is they take the seeds out of a seedy tangerine and they put them in a radiation chamber which sterilizes them so you know it kills a lot of the seeds but they said if the seed survives and grows the offspring is often sterile so then it makes a seedless version of itself so they've done that with quite a few citrus to make them seedless um, apples, they just breed them normally. Yeah, they just keep selecting for sweetness. See, the original apples were actually chosen for storage. Because, you know, before 1900, if you didn't have an apple in the winter, you didn't have any fresh food to eat. So they had storage apples. And then they, you know, since they've had refrigeration, now they're switching to apples. They taste better. <laughs> so... Yeah, all the old apples were storage apples so that people had fresh produce in the winter time. So. Okay, um, some of the less common vegetables. Now, artichoke, it would be hard to fit into one of your vegetable beds because it is a perennial vegetable, as are um, asparagus. So artichokes, you put them in the ground, they grow about three to five foot across. Uh, they love the cool weather, so they'll grow and become a fairly massive plant by spring and then start blooming. Usually they bloom before summer and make their crop. Now, if you were, this year was so cool that they might have made a second crop. So they stay up along the California coast, like, what's the city where the artichoke cap? somewhere around there yeah they can get fruit all summer because it stays cool there along the coastline uh, it stays cool so the artichokes they just cut them down after the first crop and immediately they send up another crop and they'll keep doing that as long as the weather stays below you know well below 85 degrees whereas here yeah i'd put them in full sun they may not need it, but with the gray leaves, they're not going to photosynthesize quite as well in the shade as green leaf plants do. So they're, they're meant to be in full sun. 
but uh, so in, in my neighborhood, I, I, I've been watching patches of people's artichokes in their front yard. You know, they start growing late October, November, and then they start, they get full size by midwinter, and then they're blooming, and then they cut them down, usually in June, all the way to the dirt, and then they're gone for the summer, and then they come back up again when it gets cool. So that's artichokes. Now, well, I just it, everything turns brown. So it Well, if you just left the leaves on and not didn't cut it down, it would just it would just stay dormant all summer. Uh, apparently, I mean, if the leaves if you leave the leaves on top of the ground, sometimes that the plant doesn't make another crop until all the leaves are gone. And a lot of plants, it's the absence of leaves that initiates the next round of growing. So, yeah. I don't know what soil temperature is going to do. I haven't read enough about it. Um, hopefully, well, it, well, we'll have to try and see. <laughs> Because I do have some plants out there. We, you know, we got this in nursery in Ventura. Well, in Ventura County, they're actually inland, so they get just as hot as here, if not hotter. They had a flower stalk that had just been cut off. So they already had a crop on one of these this fall, which is interesting. And it's sprouting again. So Now, we get asparagus roots in... Well, last year we got them late. There's a company, we used to get them from uh, someplace in California, but we lost track after one of my nurseries closed at sold us. We couldn't figure out who was selling it to us. So there's a nursery in Arkansas that sells uh, asparagus roots to us last year. But last year it was so hot in Arkansas up until December, they couldn't harvest them until that time. So we got them in mid uh, December. Now this year, it's been much cooler in Arkansas, more like normal, although they just finished a little heat wave for three shady degrees, but I know a couple weeks ago it was in the 40s down there. They've had some really cool blasts of air coming through, so we'll get, hopefully we'll have, be able to get the artichokes um, in a few weeks. I'll have to call them up and see what's going on down there. But we plant artichokes from the crowns. Now you can get seeds and seedlings for artichokes, uh, excuse me, asparagus too. Um, but we get the roots. And what we do with artichoke, uh, with asparagus, is we also plant them in a little ditch. So we'll get these crowns that have roots coming down like this. And then they have little buds on top of where the new shoots have come up. And you have this about, oh, four, five, six inches. Now, this is not essential for us to do in California, this little ditch thing, but they always do it in Minnesota or Michigan because they have to pile dirt on top of it for the winters there to keep that thing from freezing. So here is, it's just a tradition where you plant them deep, wait till they sprout in the spring and then bury the whole thing so it's about four to six inches underground. So uh, asparagus dormant in the winter um, they start growing with the first hint of warm weather in the spring now. Ten years ago, without the winters, these things are growing on us in January. But this year, they would have come up around April or May. So I remember back in the 80s when we had some really cool winters, I was growing asparagus, and the they would start setting up the spears in April and continue for about a month and a half. And then, uh, so on asparagus, if the stems are thicker than a pencil, that's three eighths inch, you can harvest them. Generally, the first year, everything will be like toothpick size. You just let the, the stuff grow and get, you know, they'll grow three feet or so. First set of leaves only be about a foot. And then as they get strength, they'll grow up to about three feet. Um, real beautiful plant about this big, about this wide. And then in the winter, they turn brown and die, you cut them to the dirt, 
and then in the spring they come with, with new spears and if they're thicker than a pencil uh, you can supposedly harvest them although the book says of course you know the literature is written for nationwide not just California they say wait three years well, I remember when I grew asparagus here in Orange County the second year they're hardly as thick as my thumb I'm going I have to wait two more years uh, so now, you know, I just tell people if it's thicker than a pencil, go ahead and, and cut it off. But, you know, once the plants, you, once you pick off enough spears, they get skinnier and skinnier and skinnier. So when they get skinny again, stop picking, let the plant grow and get some strength. And traditionally across the country, you only harvest in the spring. Well, a friend of mine whose farm we were next to for four years, they do two crops a year because their growing season's so long. Like if you're in Michigan, you've got four months of growing period, and that's it. Here we've pretty much got 10 months of growing for asparagus. So they would, you know, cut them in late winter and then let them grow during the spring. And then they would cut them down in midsummer and then harvest the spears again in the summertime because they had gotten enough strength to harvest again. This gets tougher, but yeah, if you get if it gets too skinny, the plant's going to get too weak. So don't harvest. You know, we're trying to save the plant. Yeah. But yeah, asparagus when you grow it, it is so. I mean, back anyone my age knows that uh, there were asparagus fields all over Orange County, especially along the Five Freeway in Irvine all asparagus fields. Now asparagus can go over 10 years. One plant can go over 10 years. Uh, artichoke, same thing, about 10 years. So they're more permanent plants in your garden. Um, and when I used to grow asparagus, a lot of it wouldn't make it indoors. You just, you're out there just chomping on it. It's, it's so good, that fresh, it's just wonderful to eat. So. Okay, here's an unusual one, the rhubarb. Now, I don't have much rhubarb right now, so don't go out there look for that. I think I only have a couple plants. But uh, rhubarb, they used to grow at Knott's Berry's Farm for the rhubarb pie. So these plants, which, you know, do their best. If you're in Canada, rhubarb plants grow this tall. Here in Orange County, they grow about this tall. So they're much smaller plants here. They like the winters. Although they don't seem to actually need it that badly because they've, they've done okay around here. So rhubarb, usually um, morning sun, afternoon shade if you have a spot like that. Or not hot sun. Because I remember seeing them at Knott's Berry's farm uh, in the fields nearby. But they wouldn't be anything, you know, there's no pave, there was no pavement around in those days. And they weren't next to any hot walls or anything. They were just out in the open. So keeping away from hot walls because the leaves get pretty big. Um, I think rhubarb's related to uh, philodendrons. You know, the indoor plants. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, they grow fast during the cool weather. And uh, if you're in Minnesota, you don't wait, you don't harvest them the first year. But here, we always harvest them the first year because they may not make it through the summer heat. So we, we harvest them when, you know, on the thicker stalks in the spring, they'll be as at least as big as your fingers. And you can take off, they said, about eight spears off of each plant. And most people tell me two or three plants in your yard are enough to make quite a few pies. So. Now the foliage is supposedly uh, the leaf, the, the leaf blade itself is toxic. It's not really toxic it's just really really bitter because uh, that whole family of plants uh, has um, oxalic acid in it which is the same thing that makes spinach kind of a, a bitter taste um, but it's a crystal that can make supposedly if you have eat too much of it I believe uh, Pineapples have it in them too. That's what makes them really tart. Um, can cause sores in your mouth. 
and if you eat consume too much of it then it might make your mouth actually swell and they said there's a danger you know there's a slight danger i've never heard of anyone choking this because their airway closed but they, they said there's a slight danger of that so you're not supposed to eat the green parts it probably helps but i i don't know how much it helps but spinach supposedly has oxalacetic acid in it. Quite a few plants do, so. But it, and on a lot of them, it makes the flavor. <laughs> I mean, you know, in nature, I don't think plants really want us to eat them. That's probably their protection, so you don't eat them. Okay, there's one. There's a, a besides peas, you know, there's the shelling peas the uh oh what are they called the ones you eat in t just the pod no um not snap the other one <laughs> the one that chinese people stir fry uh, snow peas thank you so to make the sugar this is a snap pea so to make snap peas that someone just crossed snow peas with regular shelling peas and they got sugar snaps. So that's real popular. That's one of the legumes that we grow in winter. The other legume we grow is fava beans. So this is not related closely to the other beans, uh, but it does kind of taste like a lima bean. Uh, so these and, the, and any of the peas are legumes so they can actually increase the nitrogen in your soil uh, that is, if you leave the plants dead there after the, you know, after you harvest them, so they actually create their own nitrogen. Fava beans grow about this tall, somewhere around this height. Now, uh, I've used to eat these, and I go, okay, I'm not Mediterranean, but they they claim that one or two percent of the Mediterranean population is is severely allergic to these, and it would kill them to eat them. So you have to be a little wary when you do grow these. Uh, people from apparently Italy or Greece or somewhere around that area of the Mediterranean, uh, could even be Eastern Spain, have, um, have allergies to this, or real sense of this, pro this produce. Okay, so another winter crop that we love are the onions. Onions and garlic. We've got garlic. You know, we're sold out of garlic today. Might be one up there. Uh, we ordered some more garlic. Didn't show up this week, so hopefully the garlic will be back in stock next week. Uh, now, onions, you can start the seeds right about now for your crop. What's easier, and what we do is we buy in seedlings from Texas. Uh, we get them right around Christmas between Christmas and January, hopefully we'll get some this year and we'll stock them all the way through January, even into slightly February. That's the ideal time for us to grow these plants. So you can start the seeds now. Now, the ones we get in December and January, well, I'll just say January, are the best of the real sweet onions. The really big six inch sweet onions this is not going to, I don't think this is one, well, it says grano. But the company in Texas, we buy them from Dixondale. They are this, you know, kind of like the certified supplier of, of the most famous onions, the uh, Granix, also called Vidalia or Maui. What's it called? Maui something. And then um, they have the candy, which is our top seller. The Texas Super Sweet, which is the second best seller. Uh, there's a uh, Texas Legend. There's a lot of really big sweet onions, uh, and we'll have the already they're seedlings. They're not in dirt. They come, you know, they onions are pretty strong plants. You can take the seedling um, and just pull it out of the ground, wrap them up in a bundle, ship them somewhere. They'll hold for about a month before they they dry up and die. You just put them back in the ground, uh, and away you go, and you get these, around May or June, you get these onions 
that are this big now do know that onions are above ground plants. Uh, it's, a, it's not below the dirt like radishes and turnips and carrots are. They sit on top of the ground. So when you get these little seedlings, they'll be about this, they've been cut, so they'll be about this tall and then they'll have roots down here. You can't plant them very deep. Now, some of our customers say, well, they plant them this deep to hold them up and then they uncover them when the roots get going. But the main thing they say is don't plant them any deeper than, the, than, the, than it's necessary to help them stand up, which is only about half an inch deep on, on the foliage. You can't go much deeper than that because the bulbs form above ground on <laughs> onions. That's about the same. They'll be about the same size. So they say for Texas, they start them in October, late October. And for California, they start them a little bit later. Um, now, the thing about onions, they said if the stem of the onion is thicker than a pencil um, at the shortest day of the year, which is first day of winter, it'll bloom that spring. So that's why you don't want to start them too early. If you start them too early and they get too thick, they'll think they're on their second year and then they make a flower which ruins the storage capabilities of that onion. That's, you can still eat the onion, but you can't store it <clears throat> at all once it blooms. So, um, yeah, well, it's apparently it's that's the end of its life. Once it makes a flower stalk, it's not it's not intended to go for the next year again. Um, we also carry the storage onions. So this is a storage onion. The super sweet onions would never last this long. So the sweet onions, like Texas super sweet, you harvest them in May or June and then they'll store till about September, October, but they would never make it any longer than that. So these are stored onions here. So when you buy the onion sets, which are just little tiny onions that didn't amount to anything their first year, then um, again, don't plant them too early. We got these in September, but don't plant them too early because if you do and they get too big, then they'll go to flower next spring. So. They always say wait and plant these uh, right now is probably not a bad time to plant them and these grow the onions that are more storage onions and those are onions used to being in more northern climate um, so the storage onions actually grow bigger if you grow them in Wash the state of Washington because the longer days trigger the, the bulbing on onions and these onions need a really long day before they bulb Whereas the, um, the sweet onions, which are meant for Texas and California, um, they're called the short day onions because they only need days that for the days a little bit longer than the night. Well, actually it's gotta be quite a bit longer. So the, um, this like Texas super sweet is starts the bulb out in April, not March when the days become longer, but it starts in April and then the, the intermediate day onions, like the candy onions, start bulbing up in May. So it's got to be a little longer yet. But these don't start bulbing up until June around here, even July. But if you're in the state of Washington, their days get really long really fast because they're closer to the Arctic Circle. So these guys will get bigger if you grow them in Washington than here. But these do are the storage type onions. Well, they'll store all the way through winter. Two to two inches for these, uh, maybe four inches for the really big onions. I mean, it, it was impressive. We were growing the uh, Texas Super Sweets in gallon containers, and they would you couldn't see the dirt. They would just fill the entire pot. But a one gallon container can grow a single big onion. <laughs> so. Now, I don't think any here grows wheat or oats, but wheat or oats are winter crops. So, 
Now one of the most sensitive crops to cold, another one is dill. So dill, don't even try to grow it any earlier than now because um, it just bolts up and goes to seed right away once it, once it gets a heat spell. So dill, start the seeds now or buy the plants maybe in a month uh, and then you'll get a good crop. They bloom usually in June every year from the heat. So. It's interesting though, fennel, which is related to dill, um, well, fennel blooms all summer, so, uh, but fennel, this keeps going. Fennel keeps going. Fennel is more of a perennial, whereas dill is straight annual. So it dies once it blooms, but the fennel just keeps on making shoots all summer long. It's more of a hot weather uh, crop than a cool weather crop. It may not do real, you know, you may not get what you can up north. I don't know, I don't, I don't know if our climate's really suited for the bulb funnels. Um, I'll have to ask my daughter if she's grown it before. Because it's coming from Europe. Europe is, you know, generally even Southern Europe is like Northern California. Most of Europe's like, uh, a lot of these crops come from Eastern Europe and I know some of these come from the Netherlands area, so they're coming from an area that's equivalent to Washington. So, yeah, but I don't know. I haven't grown the bulb fennel. I've grown the regular tall fennel. Now a lot of the root crops. So here's the potato seeds. I thought it was a radish or something. So they they've actually got seeds now that are pretty consistent in making potatoes back in the 80s i grew the first potato that was grown from seed what was it called explorer back in the 80s and it never made anything it just it just bloomed and made little berries it didn't make any potatoes whereas my roommate at the time he grew you know he just got some sprouting potatoes in the supermarket and he got like 20 pounds of potatoes in his patch and I got zero in mine from the seeds. So I don't know if the seeds are, unless they have to be cold stratified or something. But uh, we actually, in those days, we offered six packs of potato plants and I grew them in the ground and they made nothing. So, uh, so this is supposed to be improved uh, again, so. Radishes are one of your quickest crops. Uh, they'll sprout at 45 degrees weather and they can make a crop in one month. Just 28 days it can, you can make crop. In my yard without full sun, I can never do it that fast and my radishes always came out somewhat pungent. <laughs> you know? But one of my employees grew them in full sun at, at our, our last store we had we had some full sun areas yeah one month he, he was harvesting some really good radishes so they may need more sunlight to get that real quick crop that you know radishes same with onions the faster you grow the plants and the bigger they get the less pungent they taste the sweeter the quote sweeter they are now radishes don't need the cold they're, they're so quick you can grow these anytime here so radishes must be a biennial also I think a lot of root crops are biennials where they have to go through a winter before they bloom the next spring. Now just so you know, um, sunflowers don't need much heat. So we had a sunflower once that bloomed on New Year's Day. So apparently these come from climates that aren't that hot, where we're just not cold enough to bother sunflowers. So, you know, sunflowers traditionally bloom in the summer, but we had some seeds come up once, I think it was around in October, and they were in bloom on New Year's Day. So. 
It just came, uh, something came up from seed. Didn't have the days on here, let's see. It doesn't say how fast it, it creates the crop. Now this, if you wanted to try it, this would also be the time you're to grow quinoa. I don't know that we can do a good crop of this. I mean, generally in the United States, they grow quinoa in Colorado at high altitude. Because that's where it is. It's from the mountains of South America. It just says lower than 95 degrees with cool nights. That's like Colorado. <laughs> It says you can sow this in winter in our climate and it'll mature just before summer. Any other questions? We just were primarily going on the particular varieties of the plants, but if you have any questions about soil or or fertilizer, we can answer, and, and pest control. Now, pest control is interesting. So, most of these crops, you don't want them to bloom. So, you don't need them to be pollinated. You know, peas, you need them to bloom and be pollinated, and the beans you do too, but a lot of these crops, we don't want them to be pollinated because we want to eat them before they bloom, or right, we want to eat the flowers. So, I've been looking in lately to getting some row crops, which are essentially this kind of material and big sheets of it. Because we've seen where a lot of people grow these leaf crops and flower crops like these. And, you know, when you're this, we always get these cabbage worms eating them. Well, these don't need to be pollinated. So, you can cover the entire crop. So, there's... Um, there's a new company that one of our distributors has has now where they make these raised beds out of metal. And then they have, you can get a custom made hoop structure that goes over it that's three feet above the bed itself. The bed's about a foot high and then the hoop structure comes up to about here. And then they, they make a netting that has zippers on it so you can cover this whole thing and then unzip it to get in there and zip it back up. And that'll keep any any bug, because it's real fine material about this fine, whereas no bug at all can get in there. So that you can, you know, have this on your raised beds if you buy their brand. You know, I'm trying to find another, well, so you can buy this netting, but my company was out of the, the nine by 12s, they were out of stock. Well, the only thing they had in stock of the, what it's called a row cover, was 200 feet long. <laughs> so I figured, okay, I'll wait. So, I mean, in the future, we might carry a 200 foot of this stuff uh, and this cut off pieces for people to buy. But then we have to figure out how to support it. So most people make a frame out of PVC, just a hoop. You can bend the, the skinny PVC hoops. Uh, or just make a structure out of PVC hoop and then just figure out how to rig that up on there and then you can pull it down to cover your crop if you're growing, you know, the stuff that doesn't even pollinate. Even the stuff that needs to be pollinated like squash, you can grow it for a month or so, protect it so the bugs can't get in like white fly. And then once it starts blooming, then you can uncover it and let them in. And what's really interesting is we saw research down in Florida because they've got entire orchards covered with this stuff now to keep some of the bugs out that are spraying that fatal disease on citrus. And they said for the last three years, they've, they've been tracking the production, significantly higher production underneath screening than it is in full sun. Which, you know, at first you would say, well, that doesn't make any sense at all. But what they said is that this netting, so on a normal tree, the sun only hits it on the sunny side. This side doesn't get hit, you know, if the sun's coming from the south and the north side of the tree doesn't get, doesn't get hit by sun, but the netting tends to refract the light in different directions. 
So they said the north sides of the trees are becoming more productive because of the netting. South side may be slightly less, but the north side way more productive. So they said those trees are producing more fruit under cover than they are in full sun. Plus, you know, there's, uh, they said the temperatures moderate a little bit more. It doesn't get quite as hot or quite as cold underneath the netting. Uh, and definitely not as windy. They said the hurricanes only cause about 10% damage on the covering at one of the orchards that had it done. So, um, so the, that might be something we do a lot more of the future is cover all our crops with this. Of course, it's plastic. We know <laughs> they use something out of plastic, but it's it it's interesting that it that it that uh, plants can be more productive under shade screen than they can or the real fine mesh. I don't know that it blocks much light. I think they said this mesh was blocking maybe 30% of the light. Might have been a little less than that. I'll have to read. I'll, find, I'll have to find the article again. See how much light it was blocking, because the uh, shade screens that we use for shade plants is usually blocking uh, 60 to 80 percent of light, and they tried it at 50 percent, and the and the production was terrible on citrus at 50 percent or higher. So it has to be less than 50 percent. Well, they said underneath the uh, shade cloth, they still get, uh, at least in the orchard, they still get a lot of bugs, but they just didn't get any disease because the bugs from outside weren't getting in. So, this, this, the bugs, you know, it's hard to, for 100 acres of covered shade cloth to be totally bug free in there. But, uh, but the people who do their vegetables say, yeah, it's great, no aphids, no. Because aphids and worms are like the worst two things in all your winter crops. Now, just so you know, we, the, the most important pesticides we use, one would be a product containing spinosad. And there's, we have at least three products on the shelf that have spinosad. In fact, I think we've got five products that have spinosad, which is found in rum. So... They don't consider it really toxic to mammals at all. Um, so spinosad for all the worm, you know, the, for the worms that eat the holes, for little beetles eat the holes, and the beetles are a problem too on a lot of these crops. Anything that eats holes in the leaves, uh, the spinosad will take care of it for two weeks at a time. Most plants listed on here, you can eat it the next day. A few fruits, you're not supposed to eat it for a week. I think blackberries and raspberries and peaches, uh, but tomatoes they say next day and most of the leaf crops next day you can eat this. Um, plus most of us have, have already drank rum. So. so for all the chewing bugs, unfortunately it won't do snails or slugs. It will kill pill bugs even though they're not an insect. Um, and it also kills thrips, which is a new problem in most gardens, uh, in most agriculture now. Thrips have become the main problem bug. Thrips from all over the world coming here. Um, they mess up new growth on plants. Fortunately, they're not so active in the winter months, so this time of year it's not as big a problem with thrips. The other bugs, we get the aphids, um, white fly, mostly aphids in the winter time, make everything real sticky. The oil sprays are, are what we use. Oils aren't quite as good as, as controlling them as, as would be a ladybug or a lacewing or the natural predators, but a lot of the natural predators don't operate well during cool temperatures. Um, so most oils like this one, this is um, mineral oil, and then we have neem oil that are pure oils. They seem to control about 90 percent of the aphids you know, in one population. The problem, of course, with aphids is aphids are one of the few animals born pregnant. So an aphid can reproduce within two days of when it was born, which is really fast. So if you don't get 100% of your aphids killed off in a week, they're back to full strength. So we're having a little better success with 
the oil blends. So this is a blend of rosemary, sesame, peppermint, thyme, cinnamon, and garlic oil. And that combination seems to do a little better job killing aphids than a single oil does. But uh, jury's still out on this one. We'll see how well this works. Now the farms love these products with the essential oils because they don't have to uh, tell anyone they used it because these are all food grade materials. So anytime we use an oil like this in the nursery, I have to write a report to the government that we used it. And farms, all farms have to do the same thing. They have to write a report saying that this thing that the EPA certified for use on our farm, then we have to write it up just like a crime report. These things don't have any EPA numbers on them. So we can use these and not tell anybody. But, you know, it makes sense. Rosemary, sesame, peppermint, thyme, cinnamon, garlic. Uh, these shouldn't hurt the environment like uh, the other products do. So. What are your thoughts on, uh, I forget what the, the regular word is, but Okay, so <laughs> that's another thing that you can kill um, or be, I'm not sure how they, how they write that. Bacillus thuringiensis is the name, but it's a it's a pesticide that is sold that kills only caterpillars. Only kills caterpillars. We don't sell this anymore because we would always have to throw away more than we sold. So BT is a disease. It has a shelf life, and they make a new version of it every year. It's like a new flu shot. They make a new batch to kill these caterpillars um, every year. And if you don't sell it within three or four months, you throw it away. Yeah. Yeah, apparently. It's a living thing, so it's got a shelf life. Plus, on the plant, it's only supposed to be active for up to four hours in the sunlight. Because sunlight kills it, too. Whereas spinosad, which kills caterpillars, plus anything else that chews holes... Uh, two weeks on the plant. This is only four hours, and if it's still alive in your bottle. So, so we kind of gave up on that one and went to Spinosad because we'd be throwing away, you know, we couldn't make a profit on that. We'd be throwing away too many bottles of it. Spinosad works similarly to the way you do that? Um, no, it's, yeah, it's not... It does have to be in jet. Well, it, when it's liquid, it has to, it can kill things by contact, but it's up until for two weeks if they eat it and they ingest it, it kills them too. BT, they have to eat it. It totally messes up the gut of the insect, and then it dies from starvation. So, yes. Oh yeah. Yeah, it makes every so aphids are real popular on things like rhubarb, artichokes, uh, a lot of the big leaf stuff, uh, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, uh, kale can get aphids on the new growth, and they just make it real sticky. There, you know, there's hundreds of little green bugs on those plants on the new leaves, and they're making everything sticky. Now. When you grow broccoli or cauliflower, we do recommend that you do spray it either with BT or spinosad. I remember when I first started growing broccoli in the 80s, I go, I can't see any caterpillars. I won't treat it. Of course, we didn't have spinosad in those days anyway. We just had the BT. The leaves looked perfect, so I didn't spray my broccoli. And then I steamed it on the stove and opened the lid, and there was three caterpillars staring at me. You couldn't see them. I mean, you can't see some. You know, there's no hole. I didn't see any holes in the leaves at all. They're apparently in the flower buds eating it, but I couldn't see them until I steamed them. And <laughs> so, I, yeah. So it's not, yeah, it's not poisonous at all, but uh, not very appetizing. So from that point on, I said, okay, we're spraying the broccoli. <laughs> yes. 
Now ants kind of disappear at the end of the month. It gets too cold for them and they don't reappear until it gets warm again. But if we get, if you have ants in the garden, we do recommend getting rid of them because they're the main reason you'd have aphids and um, white fly and meaty bugs and scale and psyllids. They farm them. Sometimes they bring other bugs too that suck on your plants. Um, there's these thorn bugs we get occasionally that look like, they're, I don't know, they're really weird creatures that look like they're from a science fiction movie, but they're real small. And they're in colonies on your plant, just sitting there sucking on it. And the ants farm those too, because all the sucking insects, their excrement is sugar water. So the ants eat, eat the excrement and they farm these guys and protect, protect them from their natural predators. So. So keep the ants out of your garden, that's important. Now this is not organic. We cannot get the organic one right now. I don't know, for some reason, the company down in Florida makes it has stopped production. I'm not sure what happened to it. So uh, there is an organic ant control, which doesn't work as well as this. This one, uh, even though it's not organic, you don't have to put it on your plants. You can put it on the ground between your rows. You can put it in your neighbor's yard. The ants find this, it's a bait, cornmeal bait. There's a lot of products like this, they're all the same. They're cornmeal bait. They have a slow uh, poison and that doesn't kill them right away or they have, and or they have a sterilizing chemical that sterilizes the ants so they can't reproduce. So the ants pick this up, take it back to their colony for several days before they all die. And it uh, really works well. Um, I used it in my yard 20 years ago, and my neighbor swore for the next 10 years they did not see any ants in their yard either. So, this apparently we put enough out. We killed the super colony in the on the block, so nobody saw ants for 10 years. So it worked really well. Oh yeah, so garlic, you can buy garlic at the store and use that, but we get, uh, so the thing about garlic is you, now they make garlic seeds, but no one ever sells them. They just have, you just get the bulb separated into cloves. Each clove you plant it, you know, you can be fairly close together. The plants aren't that big and each clove will then make another bulb. So every year you go about tenfold, one clove makes a bulb with, 10 cloves, nine or 10 cloves in it. So that's how you do your garlic in. Yes. So garlic is a cool weather plant. Gilroy, they always would tell you, they plant in the shortest days of the year and harvest in the longest days of the year. And then the store all summer and then you plant it again in the fall. So, I mean, you can just leave them in the ground. They're fine just left in the ground, but each, each clove becomes one bulb. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, no garlic. the The main bulb in the center always is gone, but it's surrounded by the cloves on the side. So the stem, the blooming stem, is in the middle, and the cloves are all around it. So, yeah, it's meant to bloom. Yeah. Are the uh, green shoots that come up from under garlic or any there? Oh yeah. Well, I haven't eaten a garlic shoot. Uh, it's, yeah, I, I haven't eat, I haven't eaten them, but I'm sure they're edible. <laughs> and onion onion leaves are you can use them as green onions. Okay, let's see if I got everything here. Only because we're we don't our generally watering is not as much this time of year, so they all plants still want the soil to be wet throughout the root system to grow, which is usually a foot deep. Um, and if it's dry at all, they just won't do anything. But just know that you know plants don't really use water; they lose it, 
as, when they open their pores to get the carbon dioxide in, they're losing the water at the same time. They don't use much for anything. I mean, they use water to make sugar, but most of it is just lost in the atmosphere from evaporation. And the evaporation just drops off dramatically this time year. I mean, this morning was 43 at my at our growing grounds. So at least that's what my car thermometer said. Um, and plants don't use water, they say, significant amounts below 55 degrees. So, you know, it, it probably just broke, well, I don't know what temperature it is outside right now. It might be around 60. So for half the day, the plants may not be using water this time of year. I mean, you know, from April through October, we normally water our plants every day here. And just recently, the last few weeks, we've been skipping days because it's, it's been so cool. And then in another week or so, we can start watering once a week. Because once you get the nights consistently down in the 40s, the plants just don't use much, you know, you get a, you might hit 75 in the day, so they might be using water for three or four hours that day, and the rest of the day they're just not using any or losing any. So yeah, you can you can get by with a lot less water in the winter, like lawns in the summer time. They say you need 44 minutes of watering on grass in the summer, but only four minutes of watering in the winter per week. So um, and that would probably be the same for most of these crops. They just don't need as much. Yeah, so the, we were told by, well, the U.S. Department of Agriculture sends letters to all the farmers saying the average crop, the ratio between the numbers is something like six to four ratio. You know, you can put the 18, six, uh, 12 would be the same ratio as 624, but um, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium is what an average crop needs. Um, it doesn't have to be that accurate. Most plants, you know, use most of the things they make for vegetables are even numbers, 444, four, four, like this one. Doctor, if life is. Um, Four six five. This one's eighteen nine twelve. Still works. And we do, rec you know, if you want to keep the weeds down, cover around them with a nice layer of, of straw. We're happy to have straw finally a source of straw, though it's kind of a weird way to get straw. This comes down from Canada. It's like. Isn't there a closer source? <clears throat> but, you know, it's very light, so it must, well, it's bulky, though, so I'm sure it costs them uh, something to uh, ship it. Well, we'd rather leave it on top. It'll disappear real fast on the surface, too. So we don't like to put organic matter in the ground anymore. I don't know if you've seen our other classes on soil. So um, natural soil, in nature, soil doesn't have organic matter in it except for a few dead roots, and that's about all that ever gets into the ground. In nature, all the dead stuff, leaves and stuff, are sitting on in a layer on top of the ground, and that's where all the mineral nutrition is stored, is a layer of dead stuff on top of the ground. When you start mixing the two together, you start kind of getting a lot of root rot because the fungi and bacteria that are up here trying to decompose all the leaves will eat up your roots if you let them. <laughs> and everybody's blaming overwatering, and it doesn't make any sense to us anymore because we know it's because you've got the fungi and the bacteria from the rotting stuff in the ground with the roots. If that wasn't there, the roots wouldn't rot. And there would no be, you know, in nature, there's no such thing as overwatering. Right, 30 years ago, uh, a soil scientist told us that there's no organic matter in the ground. And so we started doing the research and we started growing plants without organic matter and they started growing a whole lot better. Because the soil itself, we know what's, if you know what sand, sand is silicon dioxide, silt is silicon dioxide, 
clay is silicon dioxide with a few minerals like iron or, or a few other minerals mixed in aluminum. That's glass. Soil is glass or pottery, the same thing. So that's what plants want, roots want to live in is they want to live in essentially glass. And if you start putting dead plants in the ground with fungus and bacteria mixed with them, they have a hard time with that. And nobody seems to get that fact. Now, the reason they've turned that stuff, the reason that it's been turned in at all is because farms have to do that. So farms a long time ago noted that if the ground was devoid of any organic material at all, nothing would grow. But if they left it on top of the ground, all it does is it blows away in the wind. It's gone. So they had to disc it in to keep it there. But on farms, it's the, the percentage that, they're, that they know they can put in is very low. So on farms, they did a study, UC Davis did a study on farms, see how much organic matter was on the farms. Because in nature, it's 0.9%. They said the farms are perfect, 1.1% organic matter in the ground. It's very important to be there, but you can't go very high. They said there are some farms in the Delta region that are reclaimed marshland and they're actually 40% organic and they can only grow seasonal crops on it, nothing permanent, no trees, nothing permanent. And they have to manage their watering irrigation very carefully because everything tends to rot in that stuff. So that's what happens when you have organic matter ground, everything tends to rot. Um, if you leave it on top, it doesn't hurt anything. So try to keep all the stuff on the surface there are some farms that say they've got a foot of organic matter on top of the ground. Uh, orchards that say they have a foot and a half. Row crop farms saying they're using a foot. And then they move it aside to plant their young plants and they put it back as the plants grow. So these are smaller farms, not conventional farms. They use the big tractor stuff. They can't put that organic matter in the ground. They have to till it in. But on conventional, so on conventional farms, they till in up to around five cubic yards of compost per year per acre. So if you know how much a pile of five cubic yards of dirt would be a pile essentially about this big, about that big, and if you till that over an acre, you can't see it. It's, it's, it's really a small amount, but that's what apparently their limit is per acre. If they get too much in the ground, then they start rotting their plants. So the farms were told what to do properly, but we're being told to make our soil still, you know, we still hear everyone saying the more organic matter you put in the ground, the better. The more organic ground you put in the clay, you improve it. Well, all that is totally backwards. You put that in the ground, you, you totally cause root rot. Yeah. Hardware store. Yeah, one of the first things we did to convince ourselves back in the early 90s is we're growing, we had big pots of pure sand, and we put strawberries and broccoli in them. We couldn't believe it. We had never grown broccoli that perfect before. It was, you know, the plant was this big, the heads were like that, not a single yellow leaf on these plants. We're going, God, this is really, a, you know, it was so night and day between that and the commercial potting soils at that time that, we were totally convinced this was one test. The strawberry plants were two foot across in pure sand. And we had never seen anything bigger than that in the conventional potting soils we were selling, which was primarily ground up dead trees. So, yeah. Um, we don't know why our, our industry can't fix itself and stop telling people the wrong thing. Um, you know, it's led by academia, which has a problem when you know, when you start um, having to say what the research papers tell you, then you're limited to what you can actually say. So, um, so anyway, yeah, um, this on top of the ground, our, our potting soils that we created for vegetable growing acid mix and top pot act like sand. There, there's no, nothing in there that just been killed off that can decompose uh, and cause trouble. Yes. I've 
Yeah, the lasagna layer, yeah. Well, it just decomposes. Uh, none of that stuff is permanent material, so. Well, try to get rid of the stuff that was had the organic matter because all it does is get worse and worse over time. It turns into sludge. Well, you can you, if you take it out of the bed and you start acting like a compost pile, start aerating it every few weeks, it'll decompose to nothing. Then it's gone. It's you know it's not there anymore. <laughs> so, but yeah, just replace it, right? Or sand. Sand's a lot cheaper, so if you want to, you know, I mean, pure sand is hard to beat. We couldn't beat it with our potting, so our potting so is just one quarter of the weight. So that's the reason we make this, so people don't, you know, you can't, this was sand here, it be over 100 pounds. So, but sand is perfect. Yeah. Right in the same layer. Right. 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 Well, the main thing with straw is to keep the the vegetables clean. That's it does that a good job at that, and it insulates and it stops the weeds. That's its main thing. It'll decompose too. I mean, straw decomposes pretty fast, so it'll be gone in three or four months. Um, and then, well, the chicken manure that you buy in bags is well aged, but right out of the chicken, it's really hot. It's um, there's a lot of ammonia in it, so you have to be careful not to do too much at one time. Well, you lose some of the nitrogen that way, so ammonia is nitrogen. Just don't do too much in one plant. Uh, they say bird birds excrement is almost pure chemical, so. That's fine. And we sell garden compost, which has got a little chicken in it, plus it's got green waste and some wood waste and some rice holes. Uh, that's all good. So. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the mycorrhizal fungus, um, does, does the fungus change its, uh, what is it, does it slow down in the, in the cooler season, the, what it does for the benefit, benefit of the plant? I don't know the temperature range for mycorrhizal fungi because if you have my, mycorrhizals are all around the world, and if they're up in Canada, it never gets warm up there. I, I don't know that that I don't know I don't know the temperature for so mycorrhizal fungus is the main system in nature that breaks down uh, dead things and puts them right back into the roots of plants. Now, interestingly, um, one family of plants doesn't use mycorrhiza, so the brassis the crucifer <laughs> crucifers. Um, Brassicaces do not use the mycorrhizal fungi recycling system. They're not partners with with mycorrhizal. So for these guys, they appreciate it if you rototill the sori before you plant them because that kills off a lot of the mycorrhizal fungi temporarily. <laughs> so they don't have to deal with it because these guys like uh, bacteria, um, you know, the bacteria decomposition better. I'm sure it's not helpful, but it's not apparently not that deadly either. I don't know how much it would have to be, but that's why I do like, you know, 
using sprinkler water because when you sprinkle the water you can smell the chlorine coming out of it whereas if you just flood it i'm sure a lot of the chlorine is going to get into the ground but um yeah at our old at our when we leased land from the farm in irvine that the chlorine in that water was so strong i don't know how how far away the treatment plant was in irvine but Boy, we were we were just amazed at the smell of the chlorine when we were irrigating the plants. It was strong. So if I were to get a mycorrhizal fungi, uh, like I said, into the powder, you know, start to plant it, whatever I'm trying to grow, but watering with municipal water, will that decrease the effectiveness? I guess it would to a degree, maybe, right? Perhaps, but... So with mycorrhizal fungi, I mean, Consumer Reports made an article in the 90s saying it's all snake oil. It is to an extent. So mycorrhizal fungi occurs in nature, it floats around as spores in the air. Rarely do you come across any land at all, except you know if they just take off a parking lot, you know, you know, uh, unpave a parking lot, or if you have a deck that's been covering the ground for 40 years, that soil there may not have mycorrhizal fungus in it. But basically, anything else would already have the mycorrhizal fungus. Now, it's not in our potting soil, so that's where it would play a bigger role have the mycorrhizal fungus introduced to it. All the Dr. Earth products have mycorrhizal fungus. Some of the Down Earth products also have mycorrhizal fungus. This one doesn't, but they have some on the shelf that do, and they do sell it separately in a little package. Uh, so it'd, it'd be good if you're growing anything other than a brassicacy in the pot to add the mycorrhizal fungus when you get it started, because that'll help the roots get its nutrition better. When we do potted plants here, we always use this. Sometimes I'll use this with it, but um, in pots you have to fertilize way more frequently than you do in the ground. So generally in the ground, every month or uh, every three months is usually good enough. When you're in a pot, if you use, like my, when I was a kid, my dad said the rules of the trade were, if you're growing a thing in a container, you fertilize it every month which is a pain to do in a nursery. So now we use, uh, use these time release things. This is once every six months. This, this is a lot easier for us. Now, in, just so you know, in the ground or in a pot, eventually you want to go organic because every, you know, there's, there's 17 minerals, plants are made out of 17 minerals, uh, 14 of them you have to apply because three of them are in carbon dioxide and water have three of the minerals that plants are made out of. This has 11, this has all 17. So this is missing two of the, three of the essential minerals, you know, that are needed in very, very tiny quantities that this has. So eventually you always want to go organic or at least put some mulch on top of the ground that should break down and get those last few that this doesn't have. But we haven't seen a single chemical fertilizer that has more than 11 yet in it. And uh, 14 would be the, would be all of them that the plant would need besides water and air. So if you use an osmosote, even if you six months fertilizer, how often would you Well, if you just throw some on there uh, once in a while, you'll get those last two micronutrients that are missing out of the osmotoke. But, you know, in the long run, in the long run, not in the short run, in the long run, the organics are better for your soil quality. Because, you know, this can actually eaten by the organisms that live in the soil that keep the soil fluffy and all that. So you need, it's nice to have some organic matter on any continuously used soil. In the short run, fine. It's like you eating candy. In the short run, you're fine. <laughs> Anything else? I think I covered. So next week, uh, I'm actually on vacation, so no class next week. Um, not sure what our topic will be two weeks from now. I'll decide next week. All right, thank you. Thank you.